Hi everybody, this is Kat and you are watching Passion Project. And today I am very excited to share that I have the uh, comic creator, Hoche Anderson. He is the author of the graphic novels, Godhead and King, his auto graphic autobiography of, uh, his graphic biography of Martin Luther King. His latest book, the horror thriller, Sand and Fury is currently in development and making its way to the big and small screen. So let me bring him on for you. Welcome, Ho. Hey, Kat, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm so glad to finally have this chat with you. I've been so excited since the news about uh, your book, which you get to tell me all about. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. So um, yeah, congratulations on Sand and Fury. I'd love to hear more about this book that you were just telling me has actually been around for quite a while, but is now making its way to the screen. So yeah, tell me a little bit about it and its journey to the screen. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, actually the book came out in um, 2008. Um, it's, uh, how can I describe it? It's sort of a dark psychological horror thriller. Um, so I'm looking at myself on the screen, which is kind of distracting. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to trying to avoid my own eyes. Uh, so it's uh, it's, uh, it's like a horror thriller. It's set in the American Southwest. It's sort of like a desert gothic, basically. And um, it's uh, based on. I've always um, had a fascination with. Um, like I was a huge fan of the Twilight Zone when I was a little kid, and mm. that sort of brand of kind of weird. Um, supernatural fiction has always resonated with me dark, dark, uh, deeply. Yeah. So Sand and Fury was kind of an attempt to um, uh, play in that terrain, um, but also talk about some of the kind of psychological trauma I was going through around the time that, it, that I was working on it, trying to, because I was reading it recently and I was able to pick out, you know, what this image meant and what that bit of symbolism meant and how it related to what I was actually going through at the time. Um, yeah. and, which wasn't apparent to me when I was actually, you know, embroiled in writing and drawing the thing. So uh, anyway, so it's a story of a banshee basically who uh, comes back to life and uh, is uh, kind of caught up in an adventure in a small town with a, a monster who seeks to take her powers away from her. Cool. Yeah, I was when I read what it was about. I was fascinated that you chose a, a, a female protagonist. You know what? Um, that's something I've done often in in my storytelling. Um, I'm um, very kind of um, conscious of um, voice appropriation, so it's always something I go to with a little bit of trepidation. But yeah. at the same time, I, you know, the, I'm the men are fifty percent of the population, but our stories have dominated, uh, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the ages. So it's nice just to be able to throw that aside and try to um, inhabit the skin of somebody else and try to, um, you know empathize and understand a viewpoint that is that is you know, not necessarily my own by birth yeah and so um so you know in in having a female character uh as a central the the, the lead were there things that you wanted to explore consciously because i know you're saying there were things that were coming up for you subconsciously what what was it like driving or what were some messages that you wanted to get across or what was your intention with it um hmm, that's a good question I don't know what my intentions were beyond just trying to create um, just an interesting, you know, like I said, a dark horror thriller. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I mean, for me, being a cartoonist and a storyteller in general, it's very therapeutic, but it's only therapeutic um, in retrospect. It's yeah. only after the fact that I'm able to, you know, kind of look back and realize what I was trying to say or, mm -hmm. or maybe not even what I was trying to say, but what um, was revealed through the work itself. So I'm not sure that I could answer that on a one-to-one -one level. I meant to do this or I meant to do that. It's more yeah. a little harder to kind of pin down. And so, yeah, do you plot everything out from the get-go or it's just like you just get up in the morning and whatever comes out ends up on the page? Like, what's your process? Actually, that's interesting. Um, usually, I'm very meticulous in my planning. It's a lot of notes. It's a lot yeah. of walks and thinking. Um, it's a lot of research. And then it's outlines and and, you know, more expansive outlines and then a, a finished script and like an actual yeah. words on paper script. Um, not every cartoonist does that. Wow. But for Sand and Fury, that was a weird beast. Um, I had just made a bunch of cash from working on a, a project and I had enough money that I didn't really have to do anything but sit on the couch for like a year. 
So uh, it was was nice. (laughs) It was a rare moment in my life. It'll probably never happen again, but it would happen then. And I thought, what do I want to do? And um, for whatever, I'd been thinking about this story for for a while. Um, Just, uh, just not in any concrete way. Just it would be interesting if maybe at some point, if I return to this material, I might do this, that, or the other. Yeah. It had been a short story before the finished book. But oh, um, wow. and so I remember I woke up on a Monday morning. I was sitting on my couch. I suddenly got this inspiration for the book. I immediately started writing, like just right there. I didn't plan it out. I thought, you know what would be cool? This scene would work. This scene would work. And then this scene would work. And a week later, I had a finished script in my hands. Wow. Which has never happened before. And it was usually when you go from uh, planning something out so meticulously, um, there's a safety net there. Um, but this time, uh, just sort of flying by the seat of my pants was actually one of the most rewarding and exciting writing experiences I've ever had, because when a twist or turn would happen in the story, it was not something that I had foreseen. It was always mm-hmm. something that kind of happened on, in the moment, mm-hmm. which is incredibly um, exciting for a writer yeah. you know, gifted with these moments. I figured if I was excited and surprised by something, that that would have to translate to the reader. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a unique, um, I've not had that experience since, but I'm glad that I at least had to ha- got to have it this one time. Um, it's really cool just hearing your process because I'm hearing like it was a short story and it was a script and I'm not hearing like we just started drawing right away. So is your first um, sort of brain dump, for lack of a better phrase, is it to go to story mode or to go to script mode? Yeah, for me, it's always, um, you know, an art lover, needless to say, images are, are highly, um, you know, very important to me, but... Without, I mean, I'm a storyteller, so without a story to back it up, it they're just pretty pictures. Um, yeah. I need, I need to have the meat, so it always comes from the characters, um, the situations that they're in, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm always trying to look for uh, what is the psychological meat that I can kind of um, that I can mm-hmm. tell. Into. You know, I always like to have like a, a story that actually resonates. Um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I had an idea for a graphic novel I was exploring with a friend at one point. So I did a little bit of research and I started picking some up because, I mean, I had read comic books as a kid, but I hadn't really delved into graphic novels. And it really blew my mind. Like when I started thinking, trying to think about the story and how it would look on the page, it really is like getting in the director's seat. Like, where's the close up and what's the angle? Like, it was mind blowing. I had never appreciated the comic form that way. The other thing about, about um, let's just talk about being like an artist specifically. Yeah. Is, uh, if you want to make a comparison to filmmaking, not only are you the director, you're also the cinematographer, you're the costume yeah. designer, you're the editor, you're the yeah. production designer. You kind of have to take on the entire, uh, the responsibilities of an entire production if you're, um, if you're yeah. an artist. So it's a, it's a, it's a serious, it's a serious job. It really is. Did you grow up wanting to do this? Was this what you were fascinated with as a young boy? Yeah, I'm one of those. I'm one of those people who kind of. I've been very one track my entire life. I was. I got into storytelling through Star Wars when I was yeah. first run as when I was a child, um, and that opened the door to storytelling in general, to visual storytelling, which is like my true passion, um, mm-hmm. and to science fiction, and the idea of world building. Um, all of those things kind of have just been obsessions with mine since I was a child. So I've been, I feel very fortunate in that I had this ridiculous dream, which nobody, including members of my own family, you know, believed was a viable dream. Um, and I've been able to actually, you know, make something of a career of it and, and, you know, pay some bills who are doing this work. It's kind of extraordinary. Yeah. Oh my God. There's so much there I want to explore. I'm like, pin, 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 pin. And, um, but so you mentioned like, like it was, you know, unthinkable growing up in your family, like this, that this was a, a viable career option. Yeah. Is that something you struggled or you were just like so determined? It was just like, this is happening. I don't care what anybody thinks. Or did you have like a plan B? I'm going to, I'm going to go study, be a doctor, but this is going to happen in the background. Um, you know what? All of the above. I, yeah. um, I was discouraged by, well, let's put it this way. When I was a child, um, the family was very encouraging. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, though, at a certain point, they expected me to kind of grow out of it and do something that an adult would do. That yeah. never happened. And then there was like a bit of resistance. 
Um, but at that point, I, I've always been that kind of person that's like, you know, I respect you and I would prefer you to be on my side if possible. But if you're not on my side, that that's OK. I'm going to do what I have to do. Yeah. Uh, so there was never a point where I thought um, maybe I should come up with a plan B. However, yeah. I mean, later on in my career when things weren't going so great and the bills weren't being paid, um, uh, I definitely considered a plan B. There have been many times where I've um, uh, turned my back on this career. I had a, some corporate jobs. Um, I, I went back to school for a long time. I was gonna. I was thinking about becoming a lawyer for a while. Um, I was thinking about joining the military for a while. There's a bunch of stuff that I thought, like, it was so painful to continue down this path because mm -hmm. I hit a brick wall that I thought, oh, damn, maybe, you know, what they were saying to me when I was younger, maybe I should have listened a little closer. But um, every attempt to, uh, you know, pivot into something else, it's almost like uh, it's like a Michael Corleone situation. Every time I thought I was out, they kept dragging me back in somehow. So um, at a certain point, I, I stopped fighting it. And I was just like, yeah. I'm in it for the long haul, come what may, sink or swim, I'm just gonna do what I do. Yeah, I love that, that's awesome. And you also have experience with filmmaking. Yes. So, um, um, yeah, yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, well, like I said, um, Star Wars was kind of the big, it was the granddaddy for me when I was a child. And mm -hmm. my first inclination was to to, to make movies. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, there was never, I didn't know anybody with a camera. The world of filmmaking is so Byzantine that it's, Trying to get it, it seemed like when you were a child, the thought of breaking into that world is impossible. Yeah. Um, so even though it was like a secret obsession, I never really attempted to to pursue it. Um, but I, I still had that storytelling obsession, and I loved comic books almost as much as I loved films. So mm -hmm. uh, it was very easy for me to kind of go down that path. Um, I'm glad I did. I'm always proud of my comic book career. I've done some good work, and hoping to do some good work in the future. Mm -hmm. I never got over my movie obsession, like ever. Yeah. So um, at a certain point, I was like, you know, dude, you're not getting any younger here, man. If you want to see if you have any you know, business doing this stuff, now's the time. Yeah. Um, so I started making short films um, uh, with a, a friend of mine who's also ha also had you know similar filmmaking ambitions. Um, he had directed some short films and he was kind of my first sort of filmmaking teacher. Even though I was directing this project that we were working on, I really relied on him to just show, just to show me as, as a guide. Yeah. Um, we made a, we made it like a 20 minute movie. Um, I loved the experience. Um, and I, I loved going from uh, being a solitary creator, which I, I enjoy because you don't have to, you don't have to tell a story by committee. You can, you know, mainline yeah. your obsessions onto the page. Yeah. That's fantastic. But it's also great to break out of your shell and go and work with other human beings and have a you know a, a community of people who are telling a, a story. That mm -hmm. whole idea of a, of a mutual endeavor is highly satisfying in a mm -hmm. way that comic book storytelling, as much as I adore it, is is not satisfying. It's just they're different experiences. Yeah. Um, so I was I very eagerly um, went to film school and you know, join a community of, of like-minded misfits and um, been trying to like, just keep a foot in both worlds yeah. ever since. I, I really just, I, I love I love being a comic book writer and an artist and making it yeah. fantastic. So. Yeah, when I was reading your bio, I, I it really resonated. I'm like, this is like the male version of me, but with the less film experience, because like, that's what I wanted to be a film director. And I was like, that's not gonna happen. And so, even my first book came out of this, it came off, came out as a script first. And then I was like, well, I got, this is not going anywhere. So I turned it into a book, you know what I mean? So I love, I love your trajectory. And now you're talking about like going from, you know, a loan project to collaboration. What does it feel like with you? Are you handing over Sand and Fury for other people to develop? Are you involved in the development of it to screen? Yes, uh, I'm actually, I'm gonna write and direct. I'm actually co-writing with this one. Um, I, um, I decided, uh, you know, since it was like a female based story, it'd probably be better if I got like a female co-writer to work me on this one. Cool. Uh, so we're we're actually, I'm just, as soon as we get off the line here, I'm gonna go back to working on the outline for the movie. Um, somebody approached me about um, optioning some of my other work. Somebody approached me about optioning my book, uh, my sci-fi book, Godhead. Here we yeah. go. And um, 
once I and uh, which I was thrilled to do, and uh, once we started talking, um, this person realized that I'd had some film experience. So I showed showed them my um, some of my short films. I sent them a bunch of links and whatnot. Yeah. And they asked, uh, and they, as some as uh, as we were talking, they came across uh, Sand and Fury. They wound up buying it on Amazon, and uh, we were. So we were talking about developing another film project. Yeah. Because this, these people like my work. And um, and we were working on another project and there was a complication. It's too, it's not really interesting to get into, but we had to kind of pivot from the first project we were working on mm -hmm. to the other thing, because the producer was just really fascinated by the book and thought yeah. it was kind of an interesting way to tell a, a, unique, um, a unique horror story. Mm -hmm. um, so they asked if I'd be interested in switching over from this other project we were going to do to working on this one. And listen, it's so tough to get anybody interested in, you know, to break into filmmaking that if you ever get the shot to direct or to write a script or whatever uh, action you can do on a film set, you have to take it. Mm -hmm. uh, as a director, the options to direct are very slim when you're starting out. So mm -hmm. I absolutely jumped on board. Yeah. I was a little reluctant just because I'd already told that story. Yeah. Once I realized that I didn't have to do a, a you know direct adaptation that we could use it as a springboard to tell a new story. Oh. Um, then it just became it was like full steam ahead. So I'm, I'm really yeah. excited about where this one's going. Um, I am a big fan of dystopias. <laughs> so this moment is very interesting. I'm <laughs> like, did I, you know, did I call this to being? Because I am like, I don't actually want to live in one. I like reading about them. <laughs> Guess what? You are. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. But... <laughs> so was that something that you were really into growing up? Was that like, well, you said the sci-fi genre, right? And world building and... Yeah, world building specifically. Dystopia is not so much. I mean, that's part of it. And if a dystopian tale, you know, came into my purview, of course, I'd be interested in it. But I'm not, I don't have like a special just place for dystopias. Yeah. Oh, because I published... Um, I published a couple of books just recently, like ebooks, um, that were actually um, pitching. We spent the last couple of weeks pitching these things um, as a television series. And I published a thing called Stone and another book called Rizzo. And they are dystopian. It's like a, it's like a five minute yeah. in the future dystopian story. Um, we started working on this about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and when we did it, uh, we were thinking, you know, actually, we're maybe we're going a bit too far. And then uh, January 6th happened. And uh, then we realized we didn't go far enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> it would be a challenge these days. It really would. <laughs> it's funny because the concepts like satire are starting to go out of line, are out of in, out of existence, because how do you satirize yeah. what is going on now? It's its, its own satire. It's pretty fascinating. So, yeah. 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 And speaking of like moments in history, like what we're living, what? So you wrote a biography about Martha, Martin Luther King in graphic novel form. What possessed you to take him on? <laughs> um, a paycheck. <laughs> a I love the honesty. That's all you're going to get. Yeah. I, um, I got the job when I was starting out. Um, I had been sending some stuff to a company called Pentagraphics Books. And uh, oh, I can hear I can hear myself all of a sudden. Um, I was uh, sending something to Fanographics, who are the publishers of Godhead. Still working with these guys after all these years. Uh, very proud of that fact. And uh, this was like 19. I shouldn't say the date; it's ridiculous. But it was 1990. I started working with them um, after uh, sending them submissions for about maybe three or four years previous, and not getting any response. Wow. And then all of a sudden, so they had started a, um, a an erotic comics uh, imprint because they were going out of business and uh, a market had emerged in the very late 80s, early 90s for erotic comics, for porno comics, in, a, in essence. And um, and they contacted me and they said, do you, you know, do you want to break in? If you want to break in, here's your, here's your chance. Fantastic. So it turns out that this, what I thought was its own company, they were called Eros Comics, um, was an imprint of Fanographics books. Mm -hmm. And so I got friendly with the publisher, Gary Groff, mm -hmm. who's a, a very noted and legendary figure in the, in the indie comics world. Um, he's an incredible publisher. And um, he, uh, he 
took a shine to my work. He could see it was embryonic, but that there was potential there. Mm -hmm. And he had wanted to do, he'd been thinking for years about doing a line of, uh, you know, socio-political biographical mm -hmm. comic books. Mm -hmm. As one of the very few, uh, you know, black creators, especially in the 1990s, um, uh, he kind of saw an opportunity with me and asked me if I were interested in taking on King. Wow. King hadn't been somebody that I was, of course I was familiar with him. Yeah. I knew the kind of highlights, but I didn't know, the min I didn't know the minutia of his life. And I didn't know any of the fine details. Mm. And um, so I was a little ambivalent just because I wasn't so connected with the subject matter, but I also knew that this was a great opportunity. So I happily said yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so it finally came time to do the book and I realized, oh my God, I've really like kind of bitten off something massive here. Um, you know, so kind of, he's such a venerated figure mm. that if you don't, you don't take the job 100% seriously and uh, you're risking yourself. You're risking, you're opening yourself up for, you know, excoriation by mm -hmm. you know, his many fans and, and followers uh, throughout North America and throughout the world. Yeah. Uh, I took it on with some trepidation, but at the same time, I'm still the same person who was like, you know, I'm doing what I want to do regardless yeah. of how you feel about it. Hope you like it. If you don't, it's all good. So yeah. I, that that also was kind of a shield. So it kind of allowed me to just tell the story I wanted to tell. And then yeah. I, luckily for me, I kind of developed like quite, um, uh, I was always critical, but I developed a great respect and admiration and fascination with the guy. I'm still fascinated with him after all these years. Um, yeah. So it's, it was I feel like he's more relevant than ever. Like, I feel like it's like, yeah. it just keeps building and building and building. It's Absolutely. really something. And, and he's a fascinating figure in that so many people will, even people who have diametrically opposed views will take from him to support whatever their particular ideology is. I heard during like the last year with, with Trump and then even after the insurrection, so-called, um, uh, I heard Republicans and Democrats talk very passionately about how King represented their viewpoints and, yeah. and you know, bipartisan communication in, in the United States right now is non-existent. So it's fascinating yeah. to me. Um, just to hear this figure who's can be adopted by, who he's almost like a Rorschach test, you know, anything you take from what you... Yeah. Um, what did you learn about him? Or, you know, what was, you know, I, and I, I, hear, I hear that you weren't like super knowledge about him at the time. You hadn't studied him yet, but... And I feel like there's been so much on him since. Maybe people have a better understanding of him now than they did back then even. Um, but yeah, what was one of, you know, a big takeaway or, or something that really resonated for you in, in that project? You know what, the biggest thing, and this was like my guiding principle throughout the entire uh, creation of that book, um, which took many years, was that this was a human being. This was not an icon. This was not some monolith. This was a dude who got up and farted and you know and you know did a number two in the morning like everybody else yeah. and you know and had many flaws and mm -hmm. but the thing is the flaws in my opinion don't detract from him they um they i'm i've said this a thousand times i'm gonna say it again mm -hmm. it's easier for me to relate to somebody who has very obvious flaws and yet is able to surmount them Mm -hmm. And King was a person plagued with every single flaw you and I have, and yet he was able to surmount them and achieve what he achieved and became, become the symbol that he became. Mm -hmm. So that to me was immensely um, compelling, um, that just that he was a real guy. He wasn't a saint mm -hmm. who, who had an extraordinary moral compass. And he was the right man for the right time. You know, he had a set of skills and a drive and a personality that that moment needed, if mm -hmm. he didn't exist, we would have had to create him. Um, yeah. So it's, just, it's so fortunate this person arrived on the scene when he did and that he was there to yeah. arrive on the scene in the first place. Fascinating guy. I feel, I don't know what you feel about this, but I feel like we're ready for a new one. <laughs> like, you know, like if there was ever a hot moment in time that creates a Jesus or a Martin Luther King or, you know, like somebody mega, like, this is the moment, you know what I mean? It'll be interesting to see who steps up. Well, I could not agree with you more. Totally. Yeah. Agree. 
Yeah. And um, I, I want to chat with you. So, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. So like the world of comic book creation, you know, I imagine it's a mostly white male thing. Um, what was it like? And I, and I even want to go back further than that, which is your name. Tell us about your crazy ass name. Uh, <laughs> What's it like to grow up with a name like that? A pain in the ass. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass when I was a kid. It's a pain in the ass right to the second. <laughs> It's a pain in the ass, but I stuck with it now. It's like maybe when I was a little kid, my I, I used to get teased relentlessly. Um, I still do, but I'm six three, and then I'll kick your ass if you do. So, uh, <laughs> so that doesn't happen as much to my face. But um, when I was a little kid, that was not the case, and I used to beg my parents to uh, to change my name. Yeah. And like, no, you'll get used to it, or it'll you'll grow into, or whatever the hell. I don't really know that that happened, but um, at a certain point, you've been, you know, you've been cat a long time. If you're yeah. suddenly you ask your friends to call you Paula, it's going to be weird. <laughs> I did that. I totally did that. I totally anglicized my name for like a, two years in middle school. So my husband always knows when people come up in the grocery store, they're like, oh, you know her from grade seven and eight when you were like, Kathy, Kathy. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> I totally did that. Yeah. I didn't realize I was walking into such charged waters there. <laughs> Well, and Che, so so your name is Ho Che Anderson, and Che was uh, kind of a, because he's from Argentina, so he's from where my family's from, and so Che was sort of like a nickname slash teasy, teasy name, like Che, 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 so like okay. even he, like, it has a legacy beyond you, you know what I mean? Like, that was his teased name, sort of, almost. Oh, wow, that's yeah. a beautiful name, though. That, that name I like a lot. You yeah, know, he owned it, right? He owned it in the end. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about just going with Che, but it's like, it's too late, man. I, mean, I am who I am. I just got to live with the pain. <laughs> yes. You wear it as a badge of honor. So yeah, so this started early on, you know, having an unusual name, maybe, you know, like, so yeah, tell me about that, that journey. Like, yeah, did it, it, was it a problem at all in the comic book industry or just everybody was like, yeah, whatever, come join us. My, my name or just being a black male in a white, you know, white yeah. Um, yeah. Probably, probably. Yeah. I mean, I never really had anybody come out and say to my face. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure there was a you know a lot of pitches that were rejected when they yeah. got a sense of who was sending in the pitch. Um, I'll tell you one quick story. I remember uh, I spent um, I, I, I was trying to develop a career as an illustrator, as in like a magazine illustrator, commercial illustrator for a while. I had some success. I did it for a number of years. Um, I did actually quite a few illustrations when I look back on it now. Mm -hmm. um, but I never, it was never like a sustainable career. It was just sort of one of the things that I was doing to try to put um, bill, to try to, you know, put money in my, and you know, food in my plate. That's what yeah. I mean. um, This was like in the uh, mid, mid to late 90s into the early 2000s. And then I, I gave up on it. But the point of the story is um, I remember in the first like year or two of me starting to send stuff out, I was close friends with a guy named Scott, who's a fellow illustrator. And he had been in the room with an art director when one of my samples randomly came in. And uh, I had done some illustrations about, um, one of which was uh, about, uh, had like something to do with the, the Harlem Renaissance. And um, there was, no anger involved in this. It was just depicting, you know, scenes yeah. from the Renaissance, Harlem, nineteen twenty-six. Oh, cool! And apparently, the art director looked at that stuff and said, "Ah, too much black rage." Shut the portfolio away and put it aside. Yeah, rage in the thing was just the black people enjoying themselves on the street. Yeah, so, um, just uh, you know, being a black person in in this field. I mean, it's a political thing. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, and then people are people will make assumptions and uh, cast you aside sometimes without giving you fair representation. But that's that's cool. Yeah. That, and I wonder, cool. like, is there a misunderstanding around? And I feel like the people who hold the power that make the decisions, I feel like, do they even know the market really? Like, do they mis uh, underestimate the hunger? For, for the content that you're going to pull out, put out. You know what I mean? Like, I wonder about the market reception to, to yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think some publishers are afraid because sometimes when you have, like, you know, women or people of color in your stories, you know, folks, 
quote unquote folks, I think yeah. we know which folks, they get upset. Um, we don't want any women in our stories. We don't want any people of color in our stories. Yeah. We want everybody just to be one thing. Yeah. And, uh, um, so I think there was um, some trepidation on the part of some publishers. Yeah. But I think that that is self-limiting and that even though for whatever reason there's going to be, you know, there might be some backlash from a certain segment, I think you're also leaving money on the table. Yeah. Knowing people who have money that they want to give you to get some glimpse of themselves. Yeah. Um, and that's not to exclude any other race. That's not to say that they can't, you know, it's, it's just that they want to see themselves as well. That's yeah. So uh, I think if you're smart, um, you know, just take a chance on this material and it might pay dividends that you didn't, uh, you didn't foresee. But listen, yeah. I cannot complain. I I'm doing fine. Uh, yeah. Got a lot of work I'm doing these days. Uh, so things are, yeah. you know. Did, um, um, I remember when Black Panther came out, that was a huge deal. Especially like my son, my son's younger with his friends. It was so exciting to see that on, on the big screen. Did that, did you see all of a sudden people were like, you know, you know, we want black comics, we want black superheroes. Like, was there like a uh, increase in demand? Did you see that? Maybe oh, a bit. Business people. Well, maybe, a, maybe a little bit. Um, yeah. I think so, probably. I mean, I didn't. That was a great question, you know, because I was starting to get a sense that there was like a slight change in the year before Black Panther came out. Yeah. Um, I definitely think it's like we're living in like a post Black Panther world. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. I'd have to give yeah. that to be honest with you. Yeah. It's just like, like I said, I, I feel like the audience is ready before the people who hold, hold the purse strings, you know what I mean? And it takes something like that where they go, oh, there's a demand. Okay. Now we're ready to like pay out. You know what I mean? And The thing is though, the, there are certain, um, the rules aren't fair because Black Panther was a phenomenon. It was an incredible yeah. film. Uh, you know, not every movie is going to be Black Panther. Yeah. You know, like some 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 films with people of color and made by people of color are not going to be good. You know, yeah. like that's yeah. what happens. So, it's, uh, but it's one of those things where if if unless the work is exceptional, it doesn't always um, mm -hmm. get the respect that it deserves. Sometimes it has to uh, achieve and succeed above and beyond for it to um, get the same level of respect that other other work will. I'm not saying that's true across the board, but I'm saying that that does tend to be yeah a reality so yeah and did you have a favorite superhero growing up or was it star wars really i was a star wars guy um actually you know what? i did have a favorite superhero the one superhero character that i've always loved and, and i've always actually wanted to work on is superman um oh. I just like that character he's so optimistic and <laughs> like got that big red red and blue suit, he's cool to me. And and I was a fanatic for the movie when I was a child. I was uh, eight years old when Superman the movie came out. So it, it set a bomb off in my mind. So I was yeah. a character, but I've never really been like a character based person. I'm more, I, I care about creators. So yeah. Next yeah. Time, the next creator are working on whatever character, I'll follow them to that character. Yeah. I don't really care about characters that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Like, I just find like the whole comic superhero revolutionary name. I'm just like, there's something there. Do you have um, a vision, a dream project, a dream character, a dream hero or something that you'd want to bring to the screen or to the page? Um, well, Superman, I wouldn't mind if I ever got the opportunity to write a Superman story. That would be pretty cool. I pitched DC on one some years ago and they, they couldn't show me the door fast enough, but, um, uh, not really. I, for me, the dream is just to be able to, just to be able to work in the art form that I love so much. Um, yeah. That's what I really want to do. Right now, I mean, I'm lucky. I, I'm working with Marvel on some stuff. Um, I'm going to be work doing a mini series for them. Um, I'm hoping to get to it by the summertime. So that's the dream for me. Like, I'm just getting to work with those guys that I, yeah, I wrote those comics when I was a child. It's, um, yeah. If you're in the comic book storytelling realm, Marvel DC, those are the two, you're gonna get the biggest audience with those people. Um, so it's, uh, if you wanna communicate through your storytelling, um, they're a good place to to, to be, to, 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 to communicate. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, yeah, I, I, when you said that, like the Martin story, that took you a couple of years. Like that's a couple of years for no instant gratification, how long you know you put these, that, that took so long. Years. That took about 17 years. Wow. 
I did the first, the first, that was a three volume project initially. I did the first volume. It took me about a year. Um, took me, cool. took me six months to write it and it took me an entire year to draw it. Wow. And then I got busy between volume one and volume two. So volume two ended up taking like 10 years. And then, um, and then uh, I fell on some hard times. Yeah. I had nothing at all going on with my life. And I was, I kind of latched on to the third volume just as a lifeline. Um, and I managed to get that one done in about a year. So wow. it was like, it was like quite a span um, yeah. where, I was, where I was trying to get those pages finished off. I didn't think I was ever gonna get it done. That's wild. That's commitment. That is commitment. <laughs> Nothing else. I'm I'm committed to an insane <laughs> degree. <laughs> so when when will Scream um, Sand and Fury get to the screen? Uh, as soon as possible. Um, yeah. We're working on the outline now. I'm hoping to have a first draft of the script finished by the end of April because we have deadlines that we have to meet. Um, and then it's uh, so I, it's going to be a while. Hopefully, hopefully in about uh, hopefully in about two years. That's yeah. usually the pipeline for these things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess everything's on Amazon these days anyway. I just think we miss the comic book store so much. Like that's our weekend thing with the kids. So it's like, oh, I can't wait for those comic book stores to open and be able to browse shelves again. And I know, right? Yeah. And I miss going, I mean, I miss that a lot, but I also miss going to the movies. God, yeah, that too. That too. The last movie I got to see was Tenet. And, uh, and it had been months since the, since I'd been in a, uh, a cinema last and it was, it was magic, man. It yeah. Was, it was so great. Well, I tell, like, I, you know, The weekend, the performer, who's also from Toronto. You're from Toronto, right? From Scarborough. Yeah, do that! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, The weekend, like, I, I like The weekend, and then I didn't like The weekend anymore. And then, you know, to watch him at Super Bowl, it really was powerful for me. Okay. You know, because I missed... I just missed performance so much. I missed the museums, the art galleries, and it was like... It, I just really loved that Super Bowl performance. It blew me away. It was, it was, it was yeah, transcendental. It was like, it was powerful for me. Man, yeah. I wish, I wish I'd seen it. I didn't actually. Oh, it was so great. It was just what we needed in this moment, you know? And it was just a, just a reminder for me of how important and powerful art are, you know? And I'm reading, um, oh, I'm reading, so Dystopia, speaking of that, I'm talking, I'm reading Station Eleven right now, which also oh, comes from Toronto. It's also set in Toronto. I've heard of that. What what is that? It so it's set. It's about a, a pandemic, uh, a flu pandemic. Oh, that's right, the pandemic novel. Yeah. And I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it comes out of Toronto, Canada, and um, it's about a traveling caravan, and they perform Shakespeare. And on the caravan, it says, "Because survival is not enough." And I don't even think I read that until after the weekend performance. But I'm like, yes, survival is not enough. This climate, this moment. Survival is not enough, and that's why we need art. And that's Absolutely. why we need music and dance and all of it. So thank you for contributing to the the greater purpose of us uh, being here is not survival. It's, it's I art. absolutely yeah. agree. And 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 just to piggyback off your point, it's also yeah. uh, just to have some togetherness, man. We're, yes. we're, animals, yes. we're living these solitary Zoom filled yeah. lives. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I miss being being with other people. So like, yeah. Oh. Well, I'm so grateful I got to be with you today. This is so much fun. We get to have a coffee with it. Everything opens up again. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Ho. Thank you so much for being on this show. It was really a pleasure. And good luck with everything. And I can't wait to just see it all come to fruition. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Kat. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks. Right now.